the force of friction. Remember I promised that we were going to talk about two surface forces and the normal force was one of them and there was going to be a parallel force? Here it is! It's friction! Friction turns out to be a very complex force. We're going to model it with a very, very simple model, which really doesn't deserve to work, but empirically it works shockingly well. What the force of friction does is opposes motion relative to the surface, sliding along the surface. If you have two surfaces together and they're moving relative to each other, friction is going to want to slow down their relative motion and make them stop relative to each other and stick together. So here this diagram is showing two forces. It's showing this N, the normal force, which is pointing away from the surface into the object, and it's showing the force of friction pointing in the leftward direction. This would happen if the object, say, is sliding to the right, which is what this shadow is trying to show. Friction is pulling it back to the left to slow it down. It's opposing its motion. Here's how we model the force of friction. It's a very complex force. We're going to model it very simply. The force of friction is parallel to a surface. So here I'm imagining a block on a level surface, and I'm applying just some force to the right on it, and then friction is going to oppose acceleration by this force. Here's how we model it. The magnitude of the force is equal to a constant mu times n, the magnitude of the perpendicular force. The reason I'm not saying f equals mu times n is because the force of friction and the normal force are in different directions. This mu is known as the coefficient of friction. It depends on what the surfaces are that are in contact, on what they are and what their conditions are. So it depends on the materials. It might depend on things like temperature, but it doesn't depend on the mass of either object. The area of contact doesn't matter. That's really weird, and it takes a while to get your brain around that, but it really is irrelevant. And how fast the two surfaces happen to be sliding across each other also doesn't matter. There's one exception to that. And here's where that exception comes in. There's basically two kinds of friction between any pair of surfaces. The first we call static friction. That's when the two surfaces are stuck together, when they're not moving past each other. Kinetic friction is the friction that acts when the two surfaces are actually sliding past each other, when their relative velocity is not zero. In all cases, the static friction between two objects is greater than the kinetic friction between the same two objects when they are sliding. If you think about this, this makes sense. It takes quite a bit of force to get something unstuck in the first place, but once it's moving, you've got some air between the surfaces and the contact isn't quite as perfect, and so they'll be sliding more freely. I'd like you to take a moment to consider right now what the frictional force is in these three different situations. A car on a road, and in one case it's skidding on dry pavement, and in another case it's skidding on icy pavement, and in the third case it's braking very hard but not skidding on dry pavement. I'd like you to rank the frictional force between the car and the road from smallest to greatest. I hope what you came up with was that skidding on ice is very low friction, then skidding on dry pavement, that's more friction than you have on ice, but it's not as much friction as stopping, that if you're braking short of a skid, you're actually braking faster. And the reason for that is that when you are braking but still not skidding, it's actually static friction between the tires and the road, because the tire is not sliding across the road. Even though it's rolling, the surfaces are not sliding past each other. Whenever, whatever part of the tire that's touching the road, at the time that it's touching the road, it is standing still, and the tire is rolling over it. I'd like to explore a little bit more the distinction between kinetic and static friction, and how it makes sense to some of your everyday experiences. One that I've already mentioned is when you start pushing an object, say a box or a crate that's on the floor, you have to push quite hard to get it started, but once you've got it started and keep pushing it, it's not as hard a force to make it happen. As I alluded to with the difference between a skid and braking short of a skid, that's the whole point of anti-lock brakes. They'll try to keep the wheel from locking up, which would make you skid along the ground. Maintaining that static friction between the tires and the pavement is a higher friction than allowing it to skid.
Learning to drive is one of my favorites. If any of you have taken driving lessons, this might be fairly fresh in your mind. Experienced drivers have no trouble pulling into a parking place and stopping the car. New drivers, however, often the car will be slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, and then it will stop suddenly. What's going on there is the friction between the brake pads and the brake rotor. When the car is slowing down, the rotor is sliding past the brake pads. When it gets slow enough, the brake pads will seize and it goes into static friction. And the car will stop suddenly because there's a much greater stopping force acting on it. Experienced drivers know to let off on the brake when the car gets very close to stopping so that this abrupt change doesn't happen. Stick slip motion is the alternation between static and kinetic friction in a slide. What happens with this is the two objects slide past each other, then stop, grip together, build up tension, build up stress, slide, stop, build up stress, let loose, slide, stop. This happens on all sorts of scales. On a very large scale, motion along earthquake faults is that way. The stick is when the stress is building up along the fault, and the slip is the earthquake itself. The sound of a bowed string instrument is stick-slip motion. If you imagine a violin bow against a string, that the bow pushes the string and they're gripped and they pull together, then the string lets loose and vibrates in the opposite direction and slides past the, slides past the bow, then they grip again, and that way the bow continues to power the vibration of the string. And in fact, the rosin that you put on a bow is basically there to minimize kinetic friction and maximize static friction. And that's why rosin is put down on dance floors as well, on ballet stages, to allow a grip when the dancer wants a grip and allow a slip when the dancer wants to slide. And everyone's favorite example of stick-slip motion is fingernails on a blackboard.